Hello, my name is Sven Zah. I work as a teacher educator in the UK and in other countries. And I've been asked to record a short talk about the relationship between world of education and anthroposophy. This is a bit of an unusual situation in that I'm not standing in real life before you. And I'm speaking to a camera and I have no control over where this recording goes. So I thought a good way of counteracting the impersonality of that is to speak from my own perspective. So I would like to share with you um, what difference anthroposophy has made in my journey as a world of teacher. And that journey begins really on the day I went to be interviewed at the Institute of World of Education, where I eventually became a student. Up to that point, I hadn't really ever heard either of World of Schools or of Anthroposophy. And I found myself in the presence of three genial men who all embodied to me my idea of what a professor looks like. So, you know, the long white hair, the interesting features. And I, I didn't know what to expect of an interview. I assumed I had to pass some kind of a test. And these three men, educated, quite impressive men, asked me about me, about my life. And this went on five minutes, 10 minutes. They wanted to know what music I liked. They wanted to know what school subjects I had been particularly inspired by. They wanted to know about my relationship to children and my own childhood. And the longer this went on, the more amazing I found it that here these three grown-ups were who wanted to know about me as a 20-year-old ex-pupil. Freshly, they're not really an adult yet. And this was an experience I'd never had before, that adults were interested in me. And so my very first exposure to people for whom anthroposophy was a way of life was that here are people who are interested in another human being without status having a particular relevance. The fact that they were vastly superior to me seemed not to matter to them. And at one point, one of them asked me, and what is your relationship to anthroposophy? And I said, I'm sorry about what? Because that was the first time that I heard the word. And he smiled a beaming big smile and he said, you've really never heard the word before. In that case, we are very happy to accept you here as a student. And the other two nodded agreement and that was that. I was in, I wasn't quite sure what I was in yet, but it's probably fair to say that that encounter did really change my life, not from the outside, but from the inside. So Rudolf Steiner said about anthroposophy that it was universal, free from bias, free from prejudice, free from dogma. He called it an experimental method of presenting what is universally human. So unlike, for example, religious contexts in which you have to sign up to something and then you get some form of a reward and it's kind of exclusive. The kind of heaven you can get into as a Catholic or as a Muslim or even the Nirvana you can attain um, is conditional on you doing certain things and not accessible to anyone else. And one of the things I found first appealing about anthroposophy is that Rudolf Steiner says, no, no, this is universal. I'm talking about the human condition here. And the sort of things I bring are not exclusive or elitist in any way. So you don't really have to sign up to anything when you get into anthroposophy, or indeed when you get into world of education. There's maybe only one aspect um, that, to be quite honest with you, I found initially quite daunting. 
when I first joined this movement. And that is the acceptance or the understanding that the human being has a spiritual core. That some part of it, maybe some people would say all of it, all of us, is spiritual. Now that sounds mystical, doesn't it? And a little bit esoteric and elitist already, but to um, counteract that bias is part of my mission, if you like, for this talk this morning. So let's begin there. What does that mean, this, the human being has a spiritual core? Imagine for a moment you yourself and everything about you that one might call generic. Let's have that represented in a diagram. Maybe with this shape here. Everything in here is, you could maybe call this the surface of the earth if you like. Everything in here is earthly. So a part of me obviously has to do with my gene pool. Nothing much I can do about that. I can't alter who whose genes I have inherited, my father, my mother, their parents. So I'm white, I'm male, at least mostly, I think. Um, I was born in Central Europe, I'm short-sighted, and I'm now in my mid-50s. So there are all sorts of things that when I was born, I could not do very much about. I didn't have much of a choice. Also the fact that I spoke German then, and to some extent speak English now. Um, this is my cultural context, my earthly part, if you like. So having established that this is a lot of who we are, let's have a look for a moment if this is all that we are. Strip away for a moment the part of you that is gendered. Are you left with nothing? Is all of you tainted by the fact that you're either male or female or diverse? Take that out of the equation. Now take your ethnicity next. Your centuries and millennia of genetic heritage. Take that away. And are you left with nothing now? Next, take away your class, whether you were born rich or poor. The education you had, the language you speak the cultural values that you've imbibed and inhibited, inhibited in, inherited, sorry. Um, and then you have this idea of nature and nurture that are both deeply embedded here. So everything that is nature and nurture, you could say, falls into this category. And the question is still the same as at the beginning. Is that it? Is this you? Because for example, your brothers and sisters, would share all of those things, except maybe the date of birth. And if you're a twin, they share even that. But they're not the same as you. Why not? So I think you will find quite quickly that there is indeed something about us that is unique, that is deeply individual, maybe the part of us, for of us that we call I. When we really speak about ourselves, that's who we refer to. The sort of thing that has a voice that gives us what we call a bad conscience, but which is in reality, of course, a good conscience, because it allows us to feel we could have done this or that slightly better. So let's represent in this diagram this with a downward curve like this. Yeah. And why do these two overlap? Because within that, within that realm, here, this is where I am at home as a human being. Part of me is subject to laws that I can do very little about. Part of me has access to a universal kind of humanity that is a beautiful paradox, both universal and deeply individual, only me. 
if we now put only those purple bits next to each other, we would find that there is no difference whether somebody is male or female from India or from Africa, whether they live in the 2020s or whether they live in the 1830s, because the very uniqueness of the human being is not affected or influenced by any of that. But what we really have access to only is this part is bit, the bit where this spiritual part of the human being incarnates. The word incarnation means going into flesh. Carne is the Latin word for flesh. And if we have one task in our life on earth, these 70 or 90 or maybe 100 years for the next generation, um, then it, it is to allow this part to grow. The part where our universal humanity and deep individuality makes a home for themselves on the earth. So that whatever is unique in us connects meaningfully with our whiteness, our Australianness, our maleness, our short-sightedness, and all those things that make us who we are in our physical sense. And yet the spiritual part of us finds a home in that. Now, in the first lecture that Steiner gives on teaching, which is in this book, the foundation course that he gave to the very first teachers of the first world of school, he draws this picture with words. And in it, he says, every human being has to try and unite these two aspects of themselves in a harmonious way. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we as teachers in the school context can facilitate that in some form. So you may recognize Ward of Education through its various um, expressions in a cultural or ritualistic sense. You might have seen beautiful colors and lovely paintings and peaceful social interactions and all these kinds of things. But I think they are all informed by an anthroposophical thought. And the anthroposophical thought is to unite or reunite what is spiritual in the human being with what is spiritual in the world around them. To not lose the connection, if you like, or to reestablish the connection. That can be done in a myriad of different ways, and it is not contingent on our direct cultural sphere of influence. So this works for Christians, this works for Muslims and Hindus, and I believe actually this also works for agnostics, and to some extent for, for atheists and materialists as well, as long as they are prepared to acknowledge that uniqueness, that core. And I'm perfectly okay with not calling that anything mystical at all. So if I think of the human being as a spiritual being, I believe the biggest difference that makes is the respect I bring towards the children I teach. My strongest memories of my own school time are all in some form connected with status, both in a good way and a bad way. And essentially they all kind of have in common that I was small and the teacher was big. I was lacking and the teacher was proficient. I was empty of knowledge and skills and the teacher was full of knowledge and skills. If, however, I believe that I am a person who is on this journey of integration of the spiritual into the temporal, and so is the child, then that status disappears. And the fact that I am now standing here teaching the child is purely a temporary arrangement because really we both are on a journey. And the only reason I'm on a 
at a different stage on that journey right now is because I was born slightly earlier than they, and I've absorbed more of this earthly knowledge that I can bring to them. But we are all educating ourselves, they are, and I am too. And that changes my perception, changes my relationship, and it gives me a deep respect for where they are, and it makes it less likely that I patronize them or bully them for that matter. So the deep humanity that you will often feel intuitively in a world of school has its root in this. It's not a religious thing, but it is a philosophical thing. Anthroposophy, the human being, Sophia is the wisdom. So the wisdom of the human being, a deeper understanding of who we are. This anthroposophical view of the human being also explains how people learn. This first teacher's course that Steiner gave in 1919 came in three parts. And every morning on 14 days, he gave anthropological lectures. So he explained to the future teachers what the human being is, how we relate to the world, how, what our intentionality is, and finally also how our body responds to all those things. And especially in those first few lectures, where he speaks about the human soul, what you might call this red area here, he talks about thinking and feeling and willing, the three soul forces, cognition, feeling and action, and how they differ at various stages in our development. So I found, I remember as a young student, I found the idea quite new and exciting and also deeply sensible that children are not just slightly less sophisticated than we are, but they're just different. And certain things need to be um, taken to children in a different way, depending on their age. So for example, a very young child does not benefit at all from an explanation of why they should be tidying their room. Not because they're stupid, but because they don't learn through cognition yet, they learn through imitation. So if you stop talking and instead sing a happy song while you start tidying the room, you will find that within a very short time, the child is tidying alongside you because they learn through doing, they learn through watching you and imitating you. Now this will not work with a teenager. That's a different approach. There you do need to use the power of persuasion, ideally logical persuasion. Whereas with a child in the middle between those two, between the early years and the teenage stage, you can appeal more to their feeling side and talk about the beauty of the room or simply explain to them how it hurts you that they're neglecting this space so much when they could so easily be responsible for it. So different approaches for different age groups, that's a really commonsensical approach, but it is one that is based on the anthroposophical understanding of the human being. If we take for a moment as an example, the phase of life that grade school is all about. So between the ages of seven and 14, we have this seven year period roughly between the change of teeth and um, the definite onset of puberty, the beginning of adolescence. And um, in this seven year period, there are two distinct moments that you might consider crisis moments. Now we know these crisis moments throughout childhood because they shock us as adults. The first one of those is when the child in the supermarket throws themselves to the ground because they can't have the chocolate bar they so dearly want and starts banging their head on the ground and really hurting themselves and being an embarrassment to everybody around. And we are completely unable to do anything about that. This is the time when the child begins to say I to themselves. So stops referring to themselves by their name and has discovered for the very first time that they are distinct from their environment. And because they can't really handle that level of knowledge yet, 
it comes out in what has commonly become known as the terrible tooth. Now, this kind of pattern repeats itself in thankfully a more gentle way when the child is in their ninth or 10th year. So when they're already at school, each child at some point comes to the realization that the natural flow in which they have always been so far is no longer a given thing, but they can actually stand against that flow. The beautiful little passage in the memoirs of Bruno Walter, who was a famous Austrian conductor, who describes that when he was nine or 10, he was kept behind at school in detention. And when the detention was over, he stepped out onto the empty school playground, a space, a vast space that he had, up to that point had only ever known as filled with noisy children. And standing in that empty, silent space, it describes that I suddenly knew that I was an I. That I was a distinct person and that something I couldn't give words to was calling on me from somewhere that I didn't know. So it's quite mystical the way he describes it, but it's like a first realization that there's something there that I can't quite know what to do with. And one of the beautiful wisdom filled things about the world of school is that it picks up on those moments and tries to support them because these are stages in our individual biographical development. So we never teach anthroposophy in school. It does not form part of the world of school practice or curriculum, but it does inform the way we approach certain things. <clears throat> so in knowing that a child is going through a crisis of identity, at the end of which they will feel that they've arrived somewhere, we give them images and skills that are somehow symptomatic and symbolic for the coping human being. So if you look at a contents list of grade three in the world of school, you will find there things like, how do we build houses? How do we bake bread? How does a potter make vessels or a shoemaker make shoes? How does a farmer grow food? And how in a great big story arc, at least in Central Europe, in the stories of the Hebrew Old Testament, Adam and Eve, who had everything made for them and who were just in the natural flow of the paradisical Eden, were then through self-awareness, they knew they were naked, thrown out of that space and they became settled from hunter-gatherers in the old testament paradise they became farmers and artisans they and their children with a sweat of their brow they won their bread yes they made the earth their home they built shelters they tamed fire they did all those things that we know were the beginnings of civilization and we are giving a subliminal if you like reassuring message to the children in our care that it's going to be okay that you might feel isolated or a little bit discombobulated by your biographical rhythms, but actually it's going to be all right. And this idea that we accompany the child by giving them what is the right thing to give at a particular age, that's an idea that's based on these spiritual rhythms that Rudolf Steiner drew our attention to. With the ultimate goal, of course, of that great aim, the education towards freedom. I'm just going to have to make a bit of space on my blackboard. I think of all the things that Rudolf Steiner thought were important for us as a species, as humanity, he would probably put the concept of freedom right at the top. The, the ability of the human being 
to follow nobody but themselves, which is very different from doing what you want. Because if you do what you want, you follow all sorts of impulses from that yellow area that are very unconscious to you. No, a conscious decision to do the right thing without anybody telling you about it, without a concept of duty or being becoming a slave to one's wishes and desires. That is what Steiner regards as the ultimate goal, if you like, an education towards freedom. And he describes in this first teacher's course how it's our task to gradually allow the child to grow into a space of increasing agency, having their own experiences and not making their learning conditional on the approval of the outside, on the benevolent um, reward by the teacher. And many of you will have probably heard this, that the very first lesson we teach in the world of school has to do with drawing a straight line. So if I do that now on the blackboard. And now I ask a child to come to the front and give them the chalk and say, can you draw that, draw that straight line too? And they will do this. And what will have happened in them? Well, they will have looked at my line and they will have tried to copy my line as closely as they could. And then they step away from it and they look at it and they see, well, the purple line is not quite as nicely straight as the yellow one. So I'm not really very good yet at school, am I? Sorry, teacher. And so from this very first lesson that they have at school, they learn to validate their own educational success by how much they can imitate the teacher. I would say that's not education towards freedom. Let me show you what I think respect for the spiritual core of the human being, what in how that would inform my didactic approach here. So again, I, as a teacher, draw the straight line with patience and care so that it's beautiful. So I've modeled something here. And so now I again hold up the chalk, but before I give it to a child, because they've seen me do it, I clean the blackboard. I say, now, who of you would like to do that? Now the child comes to the front and what have they got? A blank canvas. So now they don't have to imitate, they have to experience their own straightness. They're no longer looking at my line to imitate. They draw whatever is their own approximation of a straight line. And you know what? It looks much better than it did when it was next to mine, doesn't it? So the child now can step back from that and say, yes, that is a straight line. And then the child can do this with their own line and hand the chalk to the next child who wants to have a go. And they in turn, they draw and then they wipe away. So this is the very first lesson that they have at school. And what are we teaching the children here? What you do right now on the blackboard, what you do in your book, what you achieve, that's temporary. This is a point in time. That's what I could do right now. Tomorrow or in two hours time. That's going to be different. So education is a process. It's not something I have to achieve. It's something I engage in. And this is a super simple idea, but I think it applies to everything we do with children. We give them an experience. That we allow them to understand that experience by connecting with it. And then they walk away with a concept of what they've learned. 
but it's always their learning. The world of educator John McAllis puts it in this way. He says, during their school time, each child has to become a master in the art of learning. That's the biggest gift we can give them. Because as you've seen with that first diagram I drew for you, this process of incarnation, this process of bringing the two parts of the human being together, that never stops. And we're not going to always have it easy with that either, to match our individuality to our social sphere. That's lifelong learning. And the more I love learning, the more successful and happy and harmonious that process is going to become. So I'd like to finish with what Rudolf Steiner talks about at the end of this course. He assembled these 24 people and he talked to them and with them for three weeks. He taught them not just anthropology, but also child developmental patterns. He taught them didactics, quite detailed in some cases, and he let them try things out because only 12 of them were going to become the teachers of the first school. And they only found out the day before the school started, which class they were going to teach. And on the last day, just before saying goodbye to them. He said, there are four things that I would like you to take to your heart. The first is that the teacher should be a person of initiative, someone who says yes to the challenges the world brings. Who when presented with an invitation to act, can act. Maybe not always wisely, but always decisively. Be a person of initiative. The second ideal for the teacher is to show interest in everything the world has to offer. Everything every child brings to you, explicitly or implicitly, should move your inner interest. Take part in the life of the world around you. The third ideal is to not make a compromise with that which we know to be untrue. We have to make lots of compromises to accelerate our cultural impulse, as Steiner puts it. So, for example, we have to maybe prepare the pupils in our school for examination because that's what the law in our country requires us to do. That doesn't mean that we need to believe that those examinations are pedagogically valuable. So making a compromise doesn't mean believing in that compromise. So Steiner asks us to be authentic, I think, to our inner beliefs, even in the face of being contemporary people who make arrangements with the world around them. And that's, of course, a really difficult thing to do. I know, especially in the present climate, there are so many things that invite us to disagree with them in our environment. And that make it quite hard to be as active in cultural life as a teacher has to be. So finally, and rather reassuringly, Steiner says, and finally, don't become stale or sour. Cultivate inner freshness, and then you will be a good teacher. Carry a smile in your heart and on your face. Show the children that you are happy to be with them, that you are happy to be a human being, that you are fortunate and satisfied and thrilled to be on the earth, because what is the alternative? Now that some of you might find particularly hard, but you know what? This is to bring the circle back to where I started. This is what has sustained me for more than 30 years now, for almost 35 years in this work. This idea that I don't have to be perfect because I'm on a journey. 
I'm on a journey of incarnation, a journey of perfection that will never end in perfection. And what a thrilling ride it is, because everything that happens to me is an opportunity to learn and do it better the next time. Um, and my relationship to anthroposophy is really based on that. What does life offer me as learning opportunities? And how can I go on? And if maybe you decide to try out the path to becoming a world of teacher, I wish you many experiences like that. It's probably not going to be the easiest decision you've ever made, but I hope that one day you look back on this and, and decide like I do, that what that was the best thing that ever happened to you. Because that I can say with a complete confidence of my conviction that being a world of teacher for me is the absolutely the best job in the world. So thank you very much for um, sharing this little journey with me. And I hope you found something in it that was a little bit useful. All the best and goodbye.